Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you to open your Bibles again to our scripture reading, Luke chapter 5. I think it's profitable to hear with the ear gate and see with the eye gate the things that are before us, and it kind of reinforces uh, those truths that are there. I also have that big dinosaur looking at me back there, too, so. Yes, quite the missionary. Before we begin, I just ask we pause for just a quick word of prayer. Father, as we approach this your word, we do so with great anticipation for the truth that is in it, uh, the beauty of the descriptions that are here, and the value that it has for us today. We thank you that it does shed light onto our path and our life. It provides us with spiritual nourishment. We'd ask even now that you would hide your servant and allow Jesus Christ to be preeminent in those things that we share together. We ask it in his name. Amen. Luke chapter 5, I think it's a passage you probably have heard before. The scene opens up here in uh, just a little bit south of Capernaum and what Dr. Luke had referred to as Lake Gesenet, or what we're probably more familiar with as uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, verse 1, we see Jesus in a situation that he will find to be rather part and parcel of his public ministry. Great crowds following him. Great crowds cramming around him, wanting to hear the word, at least in the early years of his ministry. In this particular case, uh, it's a matter of location, 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 as the realtor says. Uh, he finds himself with his back to the sea, and the crowds continue to come, and he's pressed, and they're pushing on him, wanting to hear more and more, and they're just pressing up to him, hungering to hear the word of God. It, we read in our scripture, the people wanted to hear God's word, uh, Jesus teaching the kingdom to these spiritually starved people, uh, people who have heard nothing profitable from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they hear of this one, and here's Jesus. He's running out of real estate, and so Luke provides us with what is a providential, practical uh, solution to the whole thing. Uh, just down the shore a bit are a couple of fishing boats, and it was common. Uh, the boats are either pulled up onto the shore partially or anchored in some shallow water, and as was their custom, the night of fishing had produced as we know later on, nothing. But they had taken their nets out and cleaned them and laid them out so that they would dry and not rot. Uh, Jesus sees this and he goes down into uh, one of the boats and it just happens to be the boat of Simon Peter. And so he provides him with this uh, perfect location. So it was Jesus had a specially made pulpit, a more comfortable location, uh, better acoustics, and allowed him to see everybody that was in front of him. If you can imagine uh, uh, how that was looking to us. As we look at the passage, there is generally no way of knowing how long Jesus taught. Our next verse, verse 4, it says, Now when he had left speaking, there is an undetermined period of time between verses 3 and 4. We might say, well, they had fished at night. Early in the morning they had come up. Now Jesus is going to preach, and he preaches probably until the, uh, the noon hour or so. Um, but there is no indication of how long this period was. In my own heart, I'm convinced that Jesus fed these spiritually malnourished people until they were sufficient. He knew the needs of those people that were coming to hear him. And he gave to them just not in an abundance of a great summary of everything, but he knew the needs that they have, and he presented unto them, taught them the kingdom as they went away satisfied. Can you imagine what it would have been like that day? Any of the times that Jesus was there on the hillside, in the city, even here on the, on the Sea of Galilee, listening to him speak, the questions you may have or the concerns in your life. And as he brought the kingdom to you, you felt filled, warmed. You felt that 
I'm being satisfied in my soul. So as he finishes up, you go home and you say, boy, I'm, I'm really blessed by what I have heard. It's not surprising that so much of ministry today falls short when it comes to the proper feeding of the flocks. People walk out of church having received a McDonald's Happy Meal. And for the most part, many of them come desiring nothing more than a McDonald's Happy Meal because they want the toy, they want the little gift, and they feel that that was sufficient for them. Instead of receiving a well-balanced, spiritually nutritious banquet, they don't walk away with the meat of the word, but they walk away with some little toy that tickled their ears and provided them with nothing of benefit. Sometimes those behind the pulpit have little more understanding of God's word than the congregation themselves. They provide just some quick wit type of situation. My uh, grandmother continued on up in western New York and went to a church that we all grew up into, and which turned apostate and we had left, but she continued. And she said, well, the last pastor that they had, he uh, drove a beer truck during the week. That was his tent-making ministry, and she says he had all kinds of stories about his travels in his beer truck, and she says he just filled that sermon with all delightful stories of people. There are pastors that will do that. Other situations reveal, as our Lord said in John 10, but he that is a an hireling and not a shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Doesn't care for the flock. He's there filling the position. Doesn't care for their souls. When danger comes, when the hardships and the crises of life come, he's gone. Still others fill positions of responsibility simply to deceive. In Rwanda, where we have one of our Bible colleges of East Africa, the government stepped in and closed down some seven to 8,000 churches and 100 mosques in an attempt to control these places of worship, take control over what was going on. Some were closed, it said, for excessive noise. In others, as you would think of, the uh, continent of Africa, poor sanitary conditions. One newspaper article said the shutdown measures mainly targeted small Pentecostal houses run by charismatic preachers who often draw followers with promises of miracles. The Rwandan government also accuses these preachers of taking advantage of vulnerable people to grow rich. Yes, that happens. And they walk away starving. Rwanda, though, is not alone in recognizing this problem. I would venture to say that every country has pastors of some ilk, not there to feed the flock, but to fleece the flock. I'm sure Alex has run across churches in his travels, have seen the thing. Any of you who have gone overseas have found that that has been the case, even within our own country. And I'm not picking on Pentecostals or Charismatics, but the fleecing of the flock is quite common. We read back in verse 1, the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. Luke writes this, and he doesn't say they pressed upon him to receive a miracle. They pressed upon him in order to gain some type of advantage, some healing, some of this or some of that. But he infallibly writes, they pressed upon him to hear the word of God. These people could, could perceive it to be the word of God, the divine power and evidence that went along with it. And therefore, they coveted to hear that word. They hungered to hear it. They coveted to find the word of God as a very part of their life. I pray that maybe every one of our missionaries that we send out, every pastor that fills pulpits to preach the word, the word of God, that their respective flocks may covet to hear the same. Why do you go to church? Well, I have good friends there. We've always done it. For whatever particular reason, people come, but I covet to hear the word of God. I hunger for it. I so desire it to be. 
That's what's needed within every continent, everywhere, the Word of God. May every Bible school teacher that we send out to the foreign field hold to Paul's admonition to young Timothy. In the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The next level, Alex mentioned last night, sending missionaries to preach is one thing, but the need is to have the national to be trained in order that he could train another generation and another and another and another that the national takes control of those aspects of ministry. Back in our text, look down at verse 4 and we read, Now when he had left speaking, and he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for the drop. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. We're thinking about this, <clears throat> this is the first meeting, the carpenter telling the fishermen how to fish. The seamstress telling her auto mechanic, I think you need to fix my transmission by doing this. The farmer coming to the doctor and saying, you know, I've got the surgery coming up and I think it would be best if you did it this way. Here's the skilled man in fishing, his whole his whole industry, his life has been wrapped around it. Probably his father and his father before that did the fishing. He says, we know the Sea of Galilee. We know the nets. We know the shallows. We know the deeps. We know all of those things. Even without fish finders, we've done it all. Peter assures him that they have been fishing. They have been fishing all night. And they have been laboring at it. No small task, he says, and nothing was caught. Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. You know the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result? There's Peter saying, Lord, this is insane. You want me to go out? You want us to go out and do what we've done all night? And do it again in expecting more fish or some fish? There are many times in the ministry as well as in our own walk with the Lord that we sit and we say, Lord, I've toiled all night and I've got nothing. Parents, we struggle with this at times. Said, Lord, we spent our years raising our sons and our daughters. We've toiled, and this, but this, why? I've heard those testimonies, and I've seen the tears, and we've sat and we've prayed with them, and he's, Lord, we've done it all these years, and what? Lord, I've prayed long hours, days, months, years for the salvation of so-and-so co-worker, a relative, a friend. Nothing. Lord, I've, I've labored at this. Lord, I've been a, a faithful steward of all that you've given. I've given above and beyond what, what I could have ever expected in order to have something accomplished, in order to have something built or done or whatever. And I don't see results. I don't see what's happened. Lord, I've labored <clears throat> as a Sunday school teacher, a summer Bible school teacher, uh, in the kitchen, driving bus, cleaning bathrooms. I've, I've labored at all these things, and it doesn't seem nothing. There are times in our toiling, after some months or even years, that we become somewhat discouraged at the seeming lack of fruit. From pastors to missionaries to mission directors, ah uh, yes, all the way through the members of the congregation. Master, I've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. And it can just be, you know, a little bit discouraging. I see very little and yet, as Peter says, 
Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. <laughs> of all that I've experienced and all the things that I've done that have not seemed to make sense, nevertheless, I'm going to let down the net. The regular fishing pattern for these men would have been to fish early, even in the darkness of the early morning hours, and to bring the catch if there was, even the nets for sure, to, to clean them and to lay them out, sell the fish, and probably get a little something to eat, and then, if it was me, I'd be taking a nap, you know. I'd be taking a nap. I've been up to what out from what hour and noon. It's been hard, it's been difficult. But you'll notice here, these men, and note Peter and those who were with him, they heard the word. They actually, it was the most captive audience that Jesus had. Not that anybody else on the shore was not listening, but Peter, maybe James and John in that boat, they heard him. Not a word was missing. Not a syllable. Not a, did he say something? I, I, they heard it all. They could have been sleeping, they could have been eating, they could have been doing other things, but there was something that attracted them from this word that fed their souls, that that which made logic, in other words, the fishing, to do something and I've already been doing and caught nothing, made them change. He says, nevertheless, I will let down the net. The fisherman's experience in Peter had doubt about Jesus' request. But his conscience, after listening to Jesus, linked together by faith, brought him to let it down. Following his ordination in 1923, Reverend Paul Moore basically spent the next 43 years studying the two predominant languages in Cameroon, Bulu and Basa. He did such in order that he would be a translator of the New Testament scriptures. He spent his life doing that, uh, not only mastering the languages, but mastering in the New Testament translations in order to give those respective groups a faithful text. His battles to bring the light of God's word to these people was more than just finding the correct word, phrase, paragraph, but it was even bound within the struggles of modernism during his time. The struggles that the church was going through that eventually caused him to leave his old denomination and join the independent board. And if I think of a translation work, and I'm glad God never called me to do that, because that's rough. <laughs> you know, uh, translators, I think, seldom if ever see the fruit for their labors. Spend their life, as he did, doing this in order to have it correct, having people read it over, going over the text and see what it was. Seldom, if ever, seeing fruit, fish in the net. Nevertheless, Master, I've toiled all the night and I've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And he did so. Sarah Hosmond also fits this perfectly. Born in a Kentucky farm in 1883, she lost her mother at the age of 10, had one leg amputated at the age of 11. And with one wooden leg and perseverance given by God himself, she entered and graduated from the University of Illinois School of Medicine and entered into missionary service in November of 1911. She arrived in Bahrain, in the Arabian Peninsula. Soon Dr. Hosman moved to Muscat and finishing up her work in years in Sharjah. In her later years, she was assisted by three names that you're familiar with, Edna Barter, Marion Willits, and Joan Davenport. And as far as the statistics that I can glean, there was only one public profession of faith. Out of 53 years of service there, obviously the difficulties of life were, were clear, but one confirmed convert. And that young lady, Dr. Hosman, adopted and took her on as her own daughter. Master, we've labored all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net. Dr. Hosman, now in glory, 
sees the reality of the fruit of a labor that was not in vain. She can glance over those years and see the harvest that was brought in not by her directly, but by the seed that she planted in the hearts of those who at the time were too fearful to make a profession of faith, dropping Islam and running to Christ. But I know that there were those whose names will be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Paul Moore, now in glory, sees the reality of laboring hours and years over language that was not his own, translating and standing for the faith once delivered unto the saints. But his hand is seen in the Bibles of the Bulu-speaking congregations in Cameroon today. He looks out of glory and he sees the people using that and says, this is the labors of my work. Lord, I labored all those years of nothing. But now he sees the fruit. And I can guarantee that there are more than a few you can name from your past that were spiritually there as instruments of God. These who toiled and labored all night and had seen no fruit in you, at least at that time, in their eyes. Nevertheless, because Jesus had commanded them, because the Holy Spirit had moved them, they let down their nets. Think of that Sunday school teacher who prayed with you and for you unceasingly. Maybe she left, or maybe he's gone to glory and never saw the fruit of that particular labor. The pastor from your teen years who fed you first with the milk and then the meat of the word. How about that visiting missionary that challenged you to look to the fields already white in the harvest and you never thought of anything beyond your own community? How many have there been in your past? We won't know until the day that we get to glory and we see him or her or them. He says, wow, look what God did in your life. And and I had a part in that because I gave you that track. Because we sat together that day and we opened up the word and we prayed. I visited your home where we did this together. How many people not seeing much fruit at the time, nevertheless let down the net. Back in our text, beginning at verse 6, we read, And when they had done this, when they put the nets in, when they were obedient to what God had said, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came, and they filled both ships so that they began to sink. I've never fished net fishing before. I'm a rod and reel type of guy. But I remember my days with my dad out in the boat in the Niagara River. And when we just got to the right place and all of a sudden the fish were biting, you know, it was, it was a thrill. And you just wanted to, you know, Tell somebody, actually I didn't want to tell somebody else because their boats would come over and then we wouldn't get the fish. But it was a thrill and you can imagine what they were experiencing. This is, men, come over here, see what God is doing. See the miracle of that which we had labored all night at and nothing. And yet we were obedient and put the nets down and a great catch was made. Even to the point of the boats almost sinking. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished in all that were with him at the draught of the fishes that they had taken. And so was also James, John, sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Peter, James, and John had witnessed something that their fishing prowess could not bring. Something that them and all of their experience and knowledge and and whatever it was, 
fishing this, you know. They couldn't produce. And he had to come to the conclusion that it was everything by the divine hand of this carpenter from Nazareth. It, all of their efforts, all that they could put together couldn't produce what Jesus, in his perfect plan, provided for them at that time. Because they were obedient to the command of Jesus, going against all their fishing instincts, there was an abundant harvest to be had. I think of Dr. Hosman and that wooden leg to go to a male-dominated society of the Arabian coast, the pirate coast as it was called. Early articles had her coming up in a boat probably similar to what these fishermen had and they would have to go out into the water and carry her in because her wooden leg would sink down into the sand. Not only a male-dominated society of, of Muslims, but male-dominated society of missionaries. A woman doctor going to a place like this. And nevertheless, she did let down the nets. Joined later by Edna and Marion and Joan, they were obedient in their call to let down those nets. And it didn't make sense. It's not logical. It's not what the pundits were saying was the right thing to do. But they were obedient. Paul Moore did the same in Cameroon. God laying upon his heart the study of two languages. The difficulties of that. And hour after hour after hour and going through text and back and forth and sharing and back and forth. And then, and then being called to glory knowing that you don't know what's going to take place for sure. Think of Stephen and Lydia Choi today in Cambodia. 95% Buddhist. Does it make sense to bring the gospel to a, a nation like that? Or any one of the missionaries would go down their list. Why go there? Why do that? There's no guarantee of anything other than this is what God has called me to do and this is where he wants me to go. You and I recognize that our labors at times don't necessarily prove as fruitful as we would like them to be. But that doesn't excuse us for not letting down our nets. It doesn't excuse us for being like those who were preceding us in doing those things that they were called to do in obedience to Christ's command and that we likewise are called to do. We can't say, well, I don't see fruit in this. She's still unsaved and she's always going to be unsaved and no matter how many times I pray for this, no. All of the efforts that we do and we put into this and do this and such and such, it just doesn't make sense. Better to spend it somewhere else. No. Life is not made up, and as these men saw, Peter says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. We are! And the work is not accomplished because of my, not sinfulness, because of my skills, my craftiness, or whatever. It's accomplished because God says, I'll do it through you, in this one, in this one, in this one. Jesus could have caused a great wind, and in move the water back and threw a whole bunch of fish up there and says, there, how about that? But he needed somebody to do the work. And so here we are. He needed somebody to put the nets down. He could have done it anyway, but he needed somebody to put the boats out there, put the nets down in a time, you know, it wasn't logical because they not only had fish that time, but it was probably midday, probably the high point of the sun. Fish really don't like that. The deepest part of, the, of the, the sea, not there, doesn't make sense. Putting a dinosaur in the back of, you know, it doesn't make sense, you know? <laughs> a lot of things we do don't make sense, but we're not there to make sense. We're there to be obedient to that which God has given us to allow us to see that. 
any one of hundreds of missionaries at hundreds of mission stations, thousands of pastors in thousands of churches across the globe, or any one of countless numbers of believers witnessing and giving out tracts, sharing the love of Jesus with a friend or neighbor. It doesn't make sense. The world doesn't see it that way. And even in my own heart of hearts at times, you know, Lord, we've labored and nothing. But that's not the point. We do it because Jesus said to do it. And he will accomplish what he wills. There will be a harvest. The nets will be full. Fear not, Jesus told them. He says, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they have brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. The forsaking part's not easy. If you look at the lives of these men, they weren't children. They were all experienced in the craft of their families. They had responsibilities. But they forsook those things in order to be obedient to what God had called them to do. I'm not saying you go and quit your jobs. And you know, <laughs> What I am saying is that there's an evaluation what my time is involved in. The things that I'm engaged in that number one, we continue to pray and we continue to give and we continue to witness. Not because I want to see a result, but because I believe that my witness and my praying and my giving and my doing those things are profitable for the kingdom because Jesus said, let down the nets. And that's part of what I do, part of what you do. And because I won't see results right now, doesn't, it may discourage me at times, but I come back here to Peter. He says, don't be afraid about this. Continue on. Paul writes and he says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall catch the fish if we faint not. It will happen. And you may not see it until you're in glory. You may not see any of the fruit of the, what you think is a fruit of your labor. But I guarantee if you've been following these things, one day you will see somebody from 10 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever. So you, were the, you know, you helped me. I don't know if that's how it is in heaven. I don't know how recognizing people and pulling up stories and exchanging stuff, you know, I, I have no clue. But if that was a possibility, I can see how all of these things put into them. Do not grow weary in well-doing. You persevere, you continue. God says there is a harvest. You will reap. The fish will be there to the point of overflowing because he will provide. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tremendous opportunities that are ours every day. But these opportunities are given to us because you have ordained it so. You bring us into the path of somebody. You have given us the responsibility and the oversight of others. And we, Lord, sometimes will admit we're discouraged because we don't see what we feel is a fruit in our time. But Lord, you will bring the fruit in the time that you so have ordained. And you will save as you have ordained. And you will bring in the multitudes that there will be one day surrounding your throne such a great multitude singing your praises and that we might join them in perfect harmony for all eternity, giving you thanks for what you've done. Lord, keep us faithful. Help us to persevere in our day. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.